Hi, I'm Jeremy Hudson, Director of Client Services with Open Sky Group. And I'm Shannon Kaflish, VP of Sales at Open Sky Group. We're here at Tour 18, America's greatest 18 holes of golf in Flower Mound, Texas. And we're here today to talk to you a little bit about avoiding buyer's remorse when selecting your WMS and how that relates to your golf game. Hi folks, Jeremy and Shannon back again, and here we are, we're kind of getting ready to start off. We, we've done a couple of practice rounds of putting, that kind of thing. We're ready to start off kind of kicking off, you know, a project. And, you know, I kind of want to understand, you know, how you approach that versus how you approach a golf game, those types of things. Sure, yeah, and so I like to use the analogy when we're talking about a project team, right? Let's think sure. about the team you're going to enter the sales cycle with. Okay. I, I like to use the analogy of when I come play golf today, I'm not going to take this one club only. Sure, Right, sure. this isn't the only club I'm going to use throughout my round. Sure, it works great here on the green, but if I want to the green from the, from the tee box back there, this right. won't get me anywhere close, right. right? And I like to think of your team to select your WMS the same way. It shouldn't strictly be the IT department or strictly uh, be the operations right. department. When I look right. at a, a team that's going to select your new WMS, it needs to be a team that includes all stakeholders. And so I'll, I'll be honest, this also isn't a player caddy relationship. This isn't simply IT leading the charge with operations occasionally playing a role. It needs to be both of them collectively as a team selecting the next WMS for you. Operations is obviously going to have an interest in selecting a, a system that fits their operational requirements, that fits their operations needs, the way we're going to pick, the way we're going to put away in the warehouse, but ultimately the IT team also needs to be you know, choosing what they can sustain. What can an IT team support? They don't want something that's going to require heavy customizations, you know, an, a large number of support calls in the evening. They really want a system that's going to work for them as well, and both teams need to collectively enter that sales cycle prepared to select something that's best for both. Your customer service representatives are going to want a WMS that has everything that the customer needs, right? Sure. So they want to look for something that ships parcel efficiently, that has all the information listed for the customer that they need, that processes returns easily. All of those different pieces need to be considered and you need to have the right team members. Just like I have a bag full of clubs here, sure. I need to have a team full of different clubs with different roles within my organization okay. to select the right WMS. So now that you've kind of done that, you've selected your team, you've got your clubs, you've got yeah. them together. H how do you kind of organize them? Because I see you've got your bag organized sure. in a certain way. How do you now organize those roles so you kind of set the right expectations, those types of things? H how does that work? What's a good? What's some good advice for, for the folks watching now? Outside. Sure, it's important to prepare expectations off the top. When you're entering your WMS selection, have a charter going into that. Understand what you're willing to change. And then I always like to remind folks, also be aware of what you absolutely can't change. There's things you're doing well as a business. There's things that you do well, there's things that make you successful understand what those are going into your WMS selection process. If there's something you love about your operation today, don't lose sight of that. Make sure you have that as an absolute must have in your future state so you can support that organizationally going forward. And then also be aware of what are your major pain points? Where are you going to get the most significant improvement to your operation by making changes with your WMS selection? So understand when you start talking to vendors, when you present them with an RFP, etc., make sure you dictate exactly what you want to sustain about your operation and make sure you understand exactly what you want to change about your operation going into that so your WMS can really target what you want in your operation because the one thing I like to remind people of you might be changing your software you might be changing RF guns you might be changing equipment you might be changing material handling equipment what doesn't change is your customer right. they still Good expect point. the same level of service they stay, they still expect the same product they still expect it the same way or better and so make sure you don't lose sight of your end customer Customer when you're selecting your WMS. Sure. So you've kind of led us down this path of getting started. You've kind of selected the right team, yeah. kind of set those expectations. You mentioned a couple of the RFPs, processes that you don't want to change, those kinds of things. What is that kind of the third step you'd say in that kind of that group of, of functions, right? Is now you got to decide what is the actual sales process? How do we want to go about this? Is that, is that maybe the logical next step? Is yeah, that what you'd say? I, I think where we proceed from here, right? We've gotten the team together. We've, we've discussed what we really want to sustain about our operation operation, what we want to change about our operation, we've prepared our expectations. Right. You know, it's key when you get into that WMS sales cycle that you don't expect one thing to change to change your entire operation. Right. Shannon, I'm 
wearing new golf shoes today, guess what? I'm not playing much better. That didn't fix everything about my golf game, yeah. right? And same thing with the WMS. Understand what your success measurements are, and it's a collective effort, and we need to harmonize. Make sure you prepare a good RFP, and then as you continue down that sales cycle, you're gonna have your RFP, you're gonna enter your demos, you wanna make sure those demos are effective, and then ultimately you're gonna get around to really negotiations from that point down selecting, et cetera. So as we continue throughout our presentation today, what we'll really be talking about and focusing it on is how do you enter those next phases, that RFP, that demo, et cetera, what should you really be looking for? So stay tuned, we look forward to addressing those soon. Hey folks, we're back again, and this time we're here with Jeremy, standing outside one of these great holes here at Tour 18. Uh, you know, we've kind of walked you through kind of the initial process of how do you get through a buying cycle and kind of laying that foundation, understanding who your team is, making those right selections, that kind of thing. Now we're really into the meat of what I like to tell, at least what I think you like to talk about yeah. as well, right? You know, how do, we, how do we now go from being that team that has an idea to really executing on it through that sales cycle, going through those RFPs, those demos. And, and you know, I think one of the biggest things, the reason I like this hole is because it's it's kind of cool. It's got some risk reward, it does. but it's got a lot of hazards. It does. And you know, my philosophy is kind of stand up there, grip it, rip it, let it, let it run. And you're like, hey, watch out for this, do this. Kind of giving me some better advice. So, you know, I, I think maybe that kind of starts to, to kind of align with Kind of what you do after you've laid that foundation of the team, what you're doing next, right? Sure. So when I think about where I've seen folks make mistakes and, and, and really hurt themselves during the sales cycle, the pitfalls, the hazards they run into are really not being specific enough during their sales cycle. Uh, I do a lot of demos, Shannon, sure. and, and you know, I, I demonstrate software, I demonstrate how a WMS works. And, where I normally succeed most and where my customers succeed most is when they give me a script, when they give me specific sure. things they want to see. If you give a demo person just a blank slate, right, you might end up comparing putt-putt golf to tour play. Because at the end of the day, a demo instance can be very, very friendly sure. to the person doing that demo. You need to identify specifically what's important to you during your demo and be able to target that with your software partners. So have them show you exactly what you need to see for your operation. And then I like to remind folks, keep score. I mean, it seems like an obvious thing to say, but you right. and I are keeping score on our scorecards today. And I'll be honest with you, <laughs> while I'm doing that, there's going to be a few bogeys out there and there's sure. going to be a few birdies. When you just look at a demo, don't get impressed by the shiny things only. And this is an insider tip. I can show you every dashboard in the world that right. just looks gorgeous in a demo instance. We've got graphs going left to right, top to bottom, X to Y, all of them. Those graphs look gorgeous in a demo, but don't get distracted by that. Understand you still have a business to, to run and you still have an operation that needs basically an entire holistic system to support that. So target those areas. Understand gotcha. you're going to need to compromise. There may be some bogeys in some areas, but overall balance it out. Where are you going to make their biggest wins? Where are you going to solve the majority of your deficiencies? And how does your operation fit into that base product model? And so really where we're going to go next is what to watch out for during that demo in relation to customizations. How to understand what the difference is between a product yeah. extension and a product customization and how those could have vast impacts on the cost of your WMS in the long run. Sounds good. Look forward to it. See you all then. So, Jeremy, I hear us talking. I hear you kind of going through demo stuff, what yeah. we alerted, hazards, customizations, modifications, all of that stuff. You know, kind of for the, the for you know, the lay folks, that's folks that aren't involved in demos and execution sure. every day. Uh, give me, kind of give us some guidance, give us some outline, help us understand and make sense of all that noise as we kind of go through it. Yeah, I, I think a key thing to understand when we talk about products, softwares, WMSs, almost any WMS could just do about anything you want it to do with the right amount okay. of modification. And so you have to be very careful when you're looking at a demo what you're seeing and don't be afraid to ask is that a customization is that an enhancement okay. is that an extension and understand what those terms mean and each software can define them a little bit differently right. a modification an enhancement a customization 
right. and extension, what do those different terms mean? I know in my world, right, customization, modification, enhancement, those are things we really want to stay away from ultimately. Sure. We okay. really want to get into extending the base product software. But ultimately, what it means to you, when you're going through that WMS selection, don't be afraid to continue asking, is that out of the box functionality? Because ultimately, you need to know if something being shown to you is a customization, what's the cost of that customization? What's the impact in the life cycle of my product? So how long am I going to be able to support that product without additional intervention from a software vendor? And ultimately, who can do that customization? Do I have a, t uh, a tool set uh, myself where I, can, where yeah. I can change that customization? Or is that something where I have to continue to go back to the well? Uh, where I have to continue to go back to that software vendor over and over again if sure. anything changes? Because Shannon, you saw me on that last hole. I was left off the tee. And so then I had to change my, my, my approach, right. and then I went too far right, right, and then I had to change my approach again, and then I was in a bunker, and then I had to change my approach again. Right. And all of that was because I got off to the wrong start to begin with. And so when you're entering that sales cycle, make sure what you're seeing is base product, or if it's not base product, it's something that your organization can support. Sure. Otherwise, you could very well end up with some buyer's uh, remorse. Are, are you seeing in today's world, you mentioned out of the box, Yeah. are you seeing in today's world more and more platforms capable of delivering to your customers out of the box? or what's your real because I hear that and I'm sure a lot of our, our viewers hear that and they're yeah. like all right give us the real truth Jeremy you you work with customers every day in practicality, what does that out-of-the-box reality really look like? Sure, it's highly dependent on the software. Sure. And I'll be honest, I'll leave a lot of that up to Gartner. You can look sure. at the Gartner Good reviews, point. you can look at some of the other okay. business reviews out there and look at those softwares. Some are more modifiable than others. Some depend on the actual software a lot more than others. So gotcha. you have to go back to that vendor for gotcha. that customization, etc. However, there are WMSs out there that we're implementing today that do not require customizations, sure. that are upgradable, okay. that are supportable. Okay. Now that's highly dependent on the software vendor you choose but ultimately there are options out there today in 2021 where you can go find a software that you can open up out of the box you can use the standard product extensibility features build the dashboards you need build the workflows you need build the functionality you need and ultimately have something that you can upgrade that you're not locked into for a long period of time and that can evolve with that software vendor gotcha good point jeremy thanks for sharing that folks there you have it out of the box stay away from customizations we'll see you next time So Jeremy, we've talked about kind of laying the foundation with the team, yep. process, where you want to go. One of the big things you harped on, I've heard you say it, our clients hear you. I think the people out there heard you talking about staying away from customizations, those types of things. What other major things? I mean, do timelines, process, those things kind of come into play as well? How, how important are they when you're kind of weighing that as you're going through the process? Yeah, you said it. I mean, timeline is such a major piece of what you should consider when you're entering a sales cycle. I mean, yes, there's licensing fees and things like that sure. associated with your WMS, but a large portion of your project is going to be the services required to deliver that solution. Sure. And those services are 100% dependent upon defining your timeline and understanding what level of effort is going to go in to meeting that timeline. And when you define that timeline, there's a few key things you need to understand. So, yeah. If you're looking to push your timeline forward, if you need to implement rapidly, you really need to be cognizant of that and what sacrifices you may have to make. I mean, we talked about extensions a few minutes ago. If you are going to heavily extend the product, guess what? It takes time to develop those. Those don't come out of the box right. and it's going to push that timeline out. Whereas Good if point. you're going to stick with a base product approach, if your operation is willing to adapt to what the software is capable of, then guess what? You're going to be able to contract that timeline and execute sure. on time and ultimately on budget. The other key piece you need to consider is with your implementer, how is that implementer going to execute your project? You know, a big term you're hearing these days is agility. Is your, is your services provider right. going to be <laughs> agile or do they use a waterfall approach? Today, you and I have been playing ready golf, right? right? And sure. so when I'm ready to play, I play. That is a great way to think of an agile project approach because ultimately, when I'm executing an agile project, if my integrator's ready, they're gonna go, right? right? If, my, if my configurator's yeah. ready, they're gonna go. If my trainer's ready, they're gonna go. They're not right. gonna wait for one phase to end and the next phase to begin. So some of those sure. can run in parallel and ultimately that's going to accelerate your project. But that's what you need to be thinking about when you're looking to accomplish a project ahead of time or on time. What are the project approaches your implementer's going to use? How much are you going to modify? And how can you run things in parallel to hit your timeline effectively?
So, Jeremy, we're kind of here, we're kind of getting towards the end of the round, yeah. right? Kind of like the end of a project, right? Sure. You've laid the foundation, you've kind of talked about the right people, the right resources, the right expectations. Yeah. You even talked about, hey, make sure from a project standpoint, you're aligned with whoever your partner is from a development standpoint. Yeah. So those are all key things. You know, I kind of look at that, if I look at it from a golf perspective, that's kind of what I'm doing on the range, right? Sure. I'm hitting the practice balls, I'm doing all that stuff. I'm kind of getting ready to go out and play the course. We've played a few holes here now. Sure. So how do you take that, you know, that practical stuff and apply it into the real world? I've gone through this great process. I followed all these steps. I did these things. Now, how do I ensure I'm getting what I paid for? How do, how do I do that? Yeah, so I mean, ultimately, when I look at a WMS project entirely, you have to continue to focus on how you maximize your solution. You're making an investment in your business. You're trying to invest in a tool that's ultimately going to make you better at what you do. How are you going to ensure that you're maximizing that and using it to its full capabilities? And ultimately, there's a few key things I want to zoom in here. Sure. Number one, make sure your people are going to be trained and adequate to use this tool. The WMSs of, of, of kind of this generation, the WMSs that are, that are on the market right now, enable users to make data-driven decisions. And you have to have users that are willing to listen to data and react to data. That's a good point. I mean, data is such a big part of what we do now in the warehouse and then the supply chain as a whole. You have to be able to leverage that and have your supervisors, your leads, your managers really trained and ready to use a tool like that. I mean, I've seen people make the mistake before of investing in a WMS, doing everything right from a solution standpoint, but then not be able to optimize with the people they have. Gotcha. And, most of the time it's a lack of training, it's a lack of change management sure. to allow them to really understand how they're going to leverage that tool effectively. Gotcha. Secondly is you need to make sure your tools are working in harmony. A lot okay. of times a WMS is just a small piece of a larger supply chain solution. You've got a host system, an ERP that's Good dropping point. the orders to you, you've Good got point. a TMS that's planning your orders, and many times you're going to have an LMS that's attached to your WMS solution. So that transportation management system needs to be very, very capable of planning your orders effectively for the WMS to execute against. And you need a TMS that's in the same generation as your WMS. Same thing with your labor management solution. There's great solutions out there that implement engineered standards and allow you to really, you know, track your users and, and, and have very, very granular level of information in relation to performance. Make sure you're leveraging something like that sure. in unison with your WMS because you want to have the ability to really use all of that data to your advantage in relation to a workforce as well to drive that savings. Cut. And then lastly, you know, again, make sure you're doing everything right from a mechanic standpoint. What do you the mean The system by that? is one piece, right? I could have great golf clubs out here. Right. I can go buy the nicest clubs at the store. I can have the nicest driver, the nicest part of the nicest Cut. everything. But if all of my mechanics are wrong, if I'm not swinging right, if I'm not, you know, if my if my body ultimately isn't leveraging that equipment right, then we have a major issue. And True. the same thing in the warehouse. You can have a beautiful software solution, but make sure all the other contributing pieces are correct. Your material handling equipment, We've talked yeah. about your human capital, your people, and then ultimately, you know, everything else in your operation around how you're leveraging that WMS right. solution. Right. Makes sense. So taking care of kind of a couple of things there, kind of eliminating that tribal knowledge. Yeah. Right. Making sure you're not just, you talked about keeping people out of silos. You're suggesting that even from a platform perspective, yes. right? And then really kind of bringing that all together and going, okay, now let's work together to support it and be successful as we go forward. Yeah, and that's what gets those great swings on the range out to the golf course. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot, it's Jeremy and Shannon here. We've had a lot of fun. Hopefully you guys have had fun working through the course and working through how to avoid buyer's remorse in your WMS process. So, you know, we, we kind of laid the foundation, went through a few things. Jeremy, you want to walk us through kind of, again, kind of walk us through those three key principles that you look at. Yeah, when we, when we really broke this down, we said, okay, first of all, prepare correctly. Make sure you're entering that sales cycle right. prepared with the right team, with the right expectations, with the right kind of, you know, set of what you want to see during your 
sales process. Secondly, we said, how do you really navigate that sales process? How do you go from one phase to the next? How do you optimize your demo? How do you get the best out of that and then ultimately make the best decision for your business? And then finally, how do you maximize your investment? How do you get what you paid for? How do you end with the solution that you invested in? And so hopefully, again, you guys have had as much fun as we've had playing out here. Certainly, you know, there's some ups and downs on the golf course. There's likely going to be some ups and downs during the sales cycle, but ultimately the key is not regretting what you've purchased, not regretting the decision you made, and hopefully we helped you with that today. Well, thanks again, Jeremy. Appreciate it all. Again, for everybody out there, for Jeremy Hudson, Shanika Flish, we're with Open Sky Group. If we can answer any questions, be of any help as you navigate through the WMS landscape, please feel free to reach out to let us know how we can help you.